the third or fourth day into after the shootings, um, the religious community started organizing and saying, we want to have a prayer vigil. Uh, and to do so, they knew that the, the masses would be large. So for the, the candlelight vigil, I think there was 15,000 that showed up for it. Um, so they knew that there would be a substantial number of people in the largest auditorium within the city other than the arena would be the First Baptist Church, which historically has taken a very strong stance against things like gay days and same-sex marriage. Mm. And so there was a um, very difficult decision they had to come to about whether do we reject the hurting community that we're a part of or do we endorse the LGBT community by welcoming them into our church? And so there was a real struggle. Uh, and the service was interdenominational. And one of the key speakers was a bright moment. His name was Joel Hunter. And he runs a mega church in Central Florida, I think 20,000 members, one of those really large churches. He was a spiritual advisor to President Obama. And he advised Obama not to endorse same-sex marriage. He took a very strong position on it. Um, and during the prayer vigil, uh, he made a speech that ended up going viral. And in essence, what he said is, I'm standing in front of you to say I'm sorry. I have treated our LGBT brothers and sisters wrongly. I've not welcomed them when I should. I may have contributed to an event like this occurring. I know we can do better. I know we need to do better and I will do better. Who are the people coming in for counseling? Or It's <laughs> a great question. Um, we were surprised because we, we got the information out probably by 10 o'clock that morning. If you need to talk to somebody, this is where we're located at. And then we changed it the next morning because we realized we needed bigger spaces. So we really thought we would have a lot of people coming in. There was a lot to talk about, right? Um, nobody came in. We had probably less than a dozen people in the first two days. Uh, so we started sending those who were interested and willing out to meet people where they were. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, there was a lot of people donating blood because the, the blood bank was depleted with all the victims in the hospital. So there were a long line standing out in the heat. Um, so we sent counselors out with water and just walked up and down the blood lines talking to people who were waiting and were able to reach a lot of people that way. Um, we also adapted because we got a call it was Tuesday night, so two days later, um, from one of the bars that said, hey, we're holding a fundraiser for the service community, and there are a lot of people who need you here. Can you come in? <laughs> and so we sent our counselors in, and it makes perfect sense now, but it was that opportunity where those who were working in LGBT affirming bars kind of knew each other. They lost people they knew. There was a fundraiser. You introduce liquor into it, um, a lot of emotions were coming out. Yeah. Uh, so we had a lot of counselors. So that week we went into probably a dozen different bars in the area and just made ourselves available to talk to people, which is certainly not what we think of as the professional counseling environment. Um, so our clients ended up being the, you know, the people who were either at Pulse, uh, but more often than not those who were affected by it. One of the things that happens when you have a large-scale event like that, in fact, just this morning in class, we're talking about what happened just yesterday in Manchester, mm -hmm. is that it starts permeating out throughout the community. Um, it was easy to be at the epicenter and think it was just Orlando. In fact, I remember that evening, it was a Sunday evening, and the center closed about 7.38, and I went home and it was nonstop news of the coverage. And I'm like, I've lived this all day. I need to do something differently. And I turned the channel and that was an awards show for um, Broadway, whatever those are. Tony's. The Tony's. The Tony Awards were that evening. And everybody was wearing a ribbon. And I'm like, what are they wearing a ribbon for? They were supporting the Orlando community. It's amazing. So just those little things where you knew that you weren't alone are so healing and we're doing so much of this now as a world 
we're hashtagging, we're using our Facebooks or whatever social media we've got to say, you're not alone. You know, we did it in Paris, we're doing it in, in London right now, we did it in France last summer. We're saying, we as a world stand with you. Um, it was the first time to be on the other side of that fence, to know people were with us. It was affirming going back to those days where you felt so ostracized and felt like you had to be a different part of society. Now saying everybody is with you was incredibly validating. That it didn't matter if you were gay or straight. This is awful. Mm -hmm. And we're here with you. You've just listened to an audio clip from the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program's diverse collection of oral history interviews as part of our 50 Years, 50 Faces fundraising campaign. In the last 50 years since the program's founding in 1967, SPOP has collected over 7,000 interviews, as well as provided equitable fieldwork opportunities for students. To support our program's mission to document the voices of people from all walks of life, visit our donation page through the link in the description, or visit our website at oral.history.ufl.edu. That's oral.history.ufl.edu. SPOP. One community, many voices.